Um, I'm an attorney in my earlier lifetime, and so I have a tremendous amount of interest in legal issues because of that. My training was as, as a Juris Doctorate um, and trying law cases. I kind of got into the academic field at a much later type point in life uh, about nine years ago, and so I, I harken back to my legal side of things occasionally. So I was doing some work on Sierra Leone and the War Crimes Tribunals because the War Crimes Tribunals are another area I study extensively. And happened to start looking at these pictures, and this is a picture of a person who is voting uh, without either one of his hands because one of the hallmarks of the Sierra Leonean um, genocide, not genocide, civil war, excuse me, was that uh, people had limbs amputated. And he's actually voting in this particular case to um, have his government choose whether or not to do a Truth and Reconciliation Commission or not. And he's, um, I guess, presumably voting in favor of it, but at any rate, it kind of inspired me to start thinking about this topic. And um, the other, I guess, the reason that I started thinking about Truth and Reconciliation Commissions is because uh, it's, being, it's been taunted, it's been used as an idea of ways that can help societies recover after civil wars and civil conflicts. And I've always thought it'd be interesting to write a, a counterfactual paper where you look at it and say, what would have happened in the United States if at the end of our American Civil War in 1865, if we'd held a Truth and Reconciliation Commission rather than a few war crimes trials like we did and reconstru reconstruction and then on to the civil rights issues that occurred thereafter. What, when we had a different outcome. Um, so I've had a couple different reasons why it's become interesting to me. Um, and I've managed to eliminate the, there we go, okay. Um, and so I thought we should start with a cartoon because I teach a lot and when I teach I always start with cartoons whenever possible. So what we have is we have um, the fact that there it may be considered to be a gap between the fact that truth and reconciliation commissions are able to bring out truth about events that occur, but the reconciliation part isn't necessarily what ends up happening. So here we have truth on the left-hand side, which for the most part does get brought out in truth and reconciliation commissions, but the reconciliation part, which is what leads primarily to the growth of democracy and particularly of civil society, uh, don't necessarily end up happening. You end up with this gap that people and uh, states tend to fall into, and, uh, and they don't show the growth of those things. So my research question for the paper, and this is also my dissertation topic, uh, so this is a chance to kind of practice it and see questions on it, so I'm working on it as we speak, um, is whether there is a relationship uh, between the use of a TRC, or Truth and Reconciliation Commission, in a state that's experienced significant conflicts and human rights abuses as a result of that conflict. And whether or not, uh, as a result of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, you find the growth of democracy in civil society, whether there's a relationship between TRCs and the growth of democracy in civil society. I think it's useful because uh, I know we have students here, and some of you may not be really familiar with the thing that I've spent the last couple of years studying to know what a, to have some basic definition. So a basic definition of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, as defined by the Institute for Peace, is a commission that's established to research and report on human rights abuses which have occurred over a certain period of time in a particular country or in relation to a particular conflict. And it's created and vested by, uh, invested with authority based on either the government, international organizations such as the United Nations or non-governmental organizations. So essentially what we're doing, this is a really broad definition. It's a broad definition because it could be looking at things that occurred long in the past. For instance, we could do a Truth and Reconciliation Commission today over the American Civil War if we chose to, as is defined there. Um, or it could be something that's happening today. And typically, most TRCs are things that occur pretty quickly after a human rights uh, abuse occurs or a civil war occurs. Canada currently is, uh, I haven't studied the Canadian TRC yet, but Canada is currently conducting a TRC on the issue of the treatment of indigenous peoples in Canada in the past. That would be a historical type of a TRC. So those can be done as well. And they're funded by a variety of different uh, groups. And um, one of the points I haven't gotten to yet, but I'm going to be looking at in the future, will be whether or not, if it's, whether or not it is funded by the government of the country or whether it's funded by the United Nations or another agency has an impact on how well the TRC does. Because I'm going to guess that TRCs that are created by a state will be working towards issues that the state would like to have heard, which may not necessarily be the state, the issues that the rest of the society would like to hear. So there may be a difference in the uh, quality of uh, democracy or the level of democracy that uh, or growth of civil society that's created out of TRCs that um, are government-directed as opposed to United Nations or NGO-directed. 
Uh, there's some other important definitions, and uh, one of them is democracy, because if we talk about whether or not it increases democracy, we have to define democracy. There are a variety of different uh, de definitions of democracy, but my paper is going to deal primarily with two. One is an electoral democracy, which essentially says that a country has elections that are relatively fair, relatively transparent, and has, um, what does not have massive voter fraud, and uh, where the majority of people in the state are allowed to vote. This is a fairly minimal definition of democracy. And uh, when I looked at freedomhouse.org yesterday, uh, it appeared about 122 countries meet this minimal definition of democracy. Freedom House has actually looked at countries from 1974 to today and determined whether or not that they fit this definition of electoral democracy. So that's kind of a minimal democracy. But then I also looked at the broader definition of democracy, which is what we typically tend to think of as democracy, which is where you have a competitive multi-party uh, political system, universal suffrage for all citizens with really minor exceptions, such as uh, um, uh, people that have had criminal offenses, uh, something like that, but certainly is not based on ethnicity or based on uh, uh, gender. Countries that have regularly contested elections, which have secret ballots, uh, reasonable ballot security. They're not just simply given anybody to carry off or to allow to be stuffed. Uh, there's some protection for ballots and uh, does not have a massive voter fraud and where you have significant public access to the media. Because you can have all the elections in the world, you can have all the voting in the world, you can have multi-parties, but if people don't have the ability to learn anything about the candidates or about the political system, then the election doesn't end up doing you any good. So you have to have that fourth part, which is often kind of ignored when we look at democracy. We tend to look at elections and voting and parties and say, that equals democracy. But uh, Freedom House argues, and I agree with them, that you have to have the fourth part, which is there has to be some type of protection for uh, access to information in order to make it a valid democracy. Uh, political rights, as defined by uh, Freedom House's uh, program, look at uh, three things. So they basically look at all the countries in the world, all the states in the world, and they look at the electoral process, the level of elect uh, political pluralism of participation. In other words, are there a number of different parties in a state? Do people participate in the state actively? And how well the government functions. And they simply provide them with number scores. The lower your number, the, more, the higher the quality, uh, uh, the higher, the more likely that a country is considered to be free or partly free um, for this particular definition. They, they mess up with you up because it's one through seven for uh, political right, for freedom, uh, free, partly free, free or not free, but then they apply higher numbers to states. Yeah, too much detail. At any rate, you look at it and you use this in order to arrive whether or not you believe a country is making progress towards democracy. Um, civil liberties, which kind of ties into the fourth part of democracy, look at things like freedom of expression and belief, your ability to associate with other people and to organize, uh, whether or not your state's committed to following the rule of law, and the amount of personal autonomy and individual rights within a state. So they look at all those factors and they make a score basis on what they believe the state has in terms of its level of democracy. As I said, they go from 1974 to current day, and so that's one of the nice things about the Freedom House uh, figures is that uh, for the TRC states, which started around the same time as Freedom House started looking at democracy, you can actually go to 1974 and see what the state was doing then and see how it's doing today so you can get a snapshot of the time uh, frame for these various states. Uh, civil society is a little more complicated, and this is something that I'm glad to see a couple of speakers are going to be talking about both today and tomorrow, uh, because this is a little bit more difficult to define. Uh, I'm currently using a fairly uh, narrow definition of it, which just looks at whether or not there is a uh, objective association between uh, individuals that are trusting, reciprocal, and emotionally positive. Um, there are other definitions out there, and I'm going to have to play around with those a little bit. But this is what I'm working with right now. Uh, the data on civil society is very difficult to obtain, primarily because I need data that goes back to 1974, and most of the measures of civil society are much more recent, uh, like the World's Values Survey which is only in some countries and is more recent and doesn't cover the, the time period for the TRCs. So anybody with suggestions on how to find data on civil society, please email me. I'd be happy to hear about it uh, because this is something I'm working on currently. And this is true of all research projects. You, they're always a work in progress. Even if you've completed it, it's still a work in progress. Uh, so examples of things like civil society would be the number of associations that people belong to, 
uh, whether or not they indicate that they have trust in their state, uh, their courts, their police forces, and whether or not they have trust in their neighbors. Uh, this is particularly applicable to states like Rwanda, where a lot of the killings in the Rwandan genocide involve neighbors uh, on neighbors. And so continuing to live in that society and be able to develop trust with your neighbor again would be a really good indication as to whether or not healing is occurring in the state, whether they're getting over the events and being able to move on. Uh, Rwanda, unfortunately, scores very low in this for that reason, because the fact that there was so much of a loss of trust in neighbors and in the state uh, that they have not really made a lot of progress in this area. But that would be an indication that there is a growth of civil society that's positive. So what actually does the TRC do and why do we need them? Um, there are a variety of reasons why they exist, but these are the primary ones. Um, they exist to make a record of the truth of human rights abuses. There's one of the biggest things for people to deal with is the fact that things happen to them, happen to their family, happen to their neighbors, um, and then no one ever knows about it. It's always kept secret. The bodies are buried. Um, information's not let out. People are disappeared, which actually became a, a, uh, a word uh, that didn't exist before. Um, and just the simple fact that a record's made of this in some ways helps society to heal. Because until you've made a record of it and talked about it, it's impossible to get over it. So that's one of the biggest benefits of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, it, secondly, it, it provides a, a forum to discuss those abuses that's not punitive in nature. Again, my background is in, is in the legal system. The legal system is punitive. If somebody comes in and is complaining about an assault or another human rights abuse, then the result of it typically is either you're fined, you may pay a civil liability, or you're imprisoned or executed for it. TRCs don't take that type of an attitude. They don't, have, they don't have the ability to punish people for these things. So it's more likely people will come into a TRC and talk about events that happen to them because it's non-punitive in nature. Uh, they also provide a sort of justice where other kinds of justice, such as reparations and retribution, aren't possible. Again, one of the problems that you hear over and over again in these post-conflict societies is the people that were actually the perpetrators of events in my country are living high on the hog. They're living in the nice houses. They have jobs. And I'm begging in the streets because nothing is, nothing's been done for me, the victim, to help me get over what happened to me. Um, and you, I, again, I've read this and heard this over and over again in the Sierra Leone context where people who had limbs amputated are now being forced to be beggars while the people who amputated their, their limbs are even working in government today. So, you know, there isn't a way to be able to handle these issues criminally. You'd have to arrest several thousand people in order to be able to do this and, and hold trials on it. Some states like Rwanda have tried to do that. They arrested, I think, over 100,000 people in an effort to bring people to justice for the Rwandan genocide, but it simply can't happen. So you're never going to be able to convict everybody for all the abuses that happen. So based on that, TRCs provide a forum where um, some, of, some of that can be done. And people at least will have uh, some sort of justice, even if it's very minimal justice, such as somebody getting up and saying, I apologize for what happened. I take responsibility for it. At least it's a form of justice. Uh, they may prefer, provide closure for people in terms of psychological healing. And they expose the wrongdoing of previous regimes and provide legitimacy for the new regime. And the last one's kind of one of the issues, because again, if the government is funding the TRC, the fifth one on the list is the thing that's most important to them. They will bring up the abuses that happened under the old regime as a reason why there should be continued report for the new regime, often ignoring the fact that they may have committed some of their own abuses. Again, this is an issue in Rwanda, uh, which is an ongoing story um, in the Rwandan genocide and the role or lack of role of, of Tutsis in, uh, in, in uh, human rights abuses in Rwanda. So um, this is one that's pushed often by the government. The other ones are pushed more by victim act advocate groups. Excuse me. So why can't you just go to court? This seems like this should be the answer. If someone's committed a crime in the United States, uh, committed perhaps a murder or committed a rape, you go to court, uh, you call the police, you go to court, the person's tried, uh, they're, if they're found guilty, they're put in prison or they're dealt with. But the problem with it is in these cases with these massive conflicts is they're just too expensive to try all but a very few perpetrators. In Sierra Leone, for instance, I believe they tried 10 perpetrators uh, total, three from each one of the major groups and Charles Taylor, whose trial's ongoing in The Hague right now. Um, I don't know what the most recent estimate on it was, but the last estimate I read was tr uh, Taylor's trial to date has cost $48 million. If you had to spend $48 million on 100,000 violators, you know, it would equal the United States <laughs> trade deficit. 
um, or budget deficit. So uh, it can't be done. Second off, trials really don't get at the truth of events. The purpose of a trial isn't to find out what happened. The purpose of a trial is to find out the guilt or the innocent of the person who's being accused. Very little comes out in terms of the whole picture, the whole story. Uh, rules of evidence, hearsay rules, um, being able to use documentary evidence that no one can verify. All the rules that go to protect innocence or guilt in a criminal case work against getting out the entire story. So you never get a total, a total picture of, a, of an event in a, uh, in a court document, uh, they, uh, f court forum. They focus on the guilt or innocent rather than what this actual story is. So courts are inadequate for that reason also. Um, courts uh, carry the possibility of acquittals, and acquittals often do happen in, in war crimes tribunals. And this can increase impunity because, first off, the chances of ever being tried are fairly small. Second off, even if you are tried as a war criminal, chances are you may be acquitted. So again, it makes it even more difficult to be able to establish uh, uh, responsibility for actions. Uh, and then lastly, they don't support reconciliation or restitution. Criminal cases are about guilt or innocent, innocence. In some cases, they may order restitution to be paid for, for victims, but often they don't. And so uh, with the exception of a, of a few basic procedures, courts really don't provide a whole lot of uh, methods for healing for victims and in fact tend to open sores more often than heal wounds. You may not get the total picture, the person may be found innocent, and you're not going to get any restitution or reparation at the end of it, and neither is the state. So courts are inadequate to, uh, to take care of the problem, much as I hate to say it. So um, what did I look at? I looked at TRCs. There are 43 TRCs in, uh, 30, in 39 countries, and I broke them down by region. Uh, most of them have been held in Africa, uh, followed by Latin America. There have been a few in Asia, and there have been a couple in, uh, in uh, the North Africa, which I've just generically called Middle East, North Africa, uh, in Algeria and Morocco. These are ones that are acknowledged by the uh, United, Sta United States Institute of Peace as being TRCs. There are a few other ones that float around out there, but those are the generally accepted international TRCs. So that's what I've been, that's what I've been studying. Um, I've excluded six TRCs that are acknowledged as being TRCs for a couple of reasons. Um, Germany and Serbia Montenegro because it's too hard to figure out uh, the Germany because Germany was originally West and East Germany. A lot of the data covers East Germany and West Germany. It's very difficult to, to figure out uh, the events of democracy in East Germany and West Germany when they combined into the current country of Germany. Same thing with Serbia Montenegro that came out of Yugoslavia. When it was fractured, the data became fractured, spread over a variety of different countries. So it's hard to have reliable data on it. The other ones, Kenya, Liberia, Liberia, Paraguay, and the Solomon Islands, the uh, TRC is ongoing. So since it hasn't completed yet, I can't study it because it isn't completed yet. There won't be any effect from it yet. Because I thought we needed to have some kind of a control or a way of, of looking at whether or not these same effects were experienced by countries that didn't have TRCs, I also looked at a variety of states that, um, that fit the same basic idea as the states that had TRCs but did not have a TRC. So these are states that had either civil wars or major conflicts that lasted at least a year and had a significant number of casualties, but did not have a TRC. And the thinking on it is that the TRC uh, provides for healing or provides for, uh, for a democracy and civil society, then you should find that in these non-TRC non states, they don't have the same kind of improvements. Um, and that's, in fact, what my study ends up showing. So I thought it was useful to look at these countries and say, they didn't have a TRC. Did they also see a growth in democracy? Is it just time heals all wounds? Or is there actually an effect by the, by the TRC itself? OK. Um, and which is basically what that slide says. OK. Uh, so I had four hypotheses for the paper. Uh, the first one is that post-conflict states that actually have a TRC uh, experience an increase in electoral democracy as opposed to states without having had a TRC. So although they may not necessarily become a full-fledged democracy, at least they make the first step towards one, which is to be an electoral democracy, where they'll have valid elections, people will be able to vote, you'll see a growth in, in democratic ideas. So that's the first hypothesis. The second is that they will experience an increase in political rights, uh, but that that increase in political rights will be at a lower level, lower rate than that of electoral democracy. Again. Electoral democracies happen first. Full-blown political rights tend to come second. So you'd expect that it may take longer and you may not see quite the same growth in political rights as you did in electoral democracy. 
Uh, the third is that they will experience an increase in civil liberties, but again, at even a slower pace, because civil liberties is the last thing that happens. First, you get the right to vote. Second, your, your government becomes stabilized. And third, your government's comfortable enough with the stability to be able to afford you more significant civil liberties. It's been the pattern for most democratizing states. It seems to be the pattern for states that have had uh, TRCs as well. So that was my third hypothesis to see whether that was true or not. Uh, the last one deals with uh, um, uh, last one deals with uh, whether or not post-conflict states that have a TRC actually experience electoral democracy, political rights, and civil society faster and more effectively than ones that did not have a TRC, which is kind of the big, the big question. That does the TRC really result in an increase in, in democracy, or does it not? So that's kind of the big question. So uh, looking at my states, I found that the first three hypotheses, for the most part, do seem to be carried out. Um, in terms of electoral democracies, states that had a, uh, uh, had a TRC um, tend to do better in terms of electoral democracies after the TRC than they did before, taking the date that the TRC started as the year that we look at that. Um, in only one case did they actually do worse than they did, uh, than they were before they had a TRC. So TRC at least doesn't make it worse, and in, one, in most cases it made it better. In seven cases, there wasn't any big difference. In 11 cases, there was an increase. Some states had never been electoral democracy at all, so those didn't help much. In other states, the Civil War occurred either before uh, the data was accumulated or has, hadn't been concluded, so those also didn't help much. So the significant number is the 11 uh, and the 1. States that did not have a TRC instead uh, had a smaller number of states that became, um, had a higher level of electoral democracy and had a lot more incidents of electoral democracy actually decreasing. So you're seeing states that didn't have a TRC, had a uh, civil war, you're finding that they're actually becoming less democratic after the end of the civil war. So TRC does seem to have an effect on that. In terms of political rights, um, states that had a TRC saw an increase in political rights as defined by Freedom House by at least one point in 50% of the cases, and it increased by less than one point in 30% and it only declined in 18%. So again, you're seeing a connection between growth of political rights and uh, TRCs. States without a TRC actually saw a decline in 45% of the time, so significant difference between those. So you're seeing that there does seem to be a real relationship between TRCs and a, uh, a growth in political rights. Uh, biggest differences were in uh, Ghana and Panama, both of which experienced a, an almost four-point rise uh, before, uh, from after the TRC, from before the TRC, which is a, out of seven points is a huge rise. So those two countries, there was a major difference in them. So findings on civil liberties, um, again, you found a fairly significant number of states that it increased it by at least one point, um, and not as many as you did in terms of political rights, but if you put the one points plus the two points together, you'll find that almost all states at least had some increase in civil liberties, maybe not big ones, but some increase, as opposed to um, your non-TRC states were actually only 45% of the time it actually got worse. So again, you're seeing a difference between them. States that had the biggest difference in terms of civil liberties are Chile and uh, South Africa. So South Africa already had done, had done fairly well in terms of political rights and now did significantly better in terms of civil liberties, which was one of their big challenges they faced, and you do see that. Okay. Um, findings on civil society, I'm not going to spend much time on it because of time. But uh, I, my findings are somewhat uh, ambiguous at this point on that, primarily because of the lack of data, which I'm working on. I did look at the Corruption Perception Index, which does provide some data. And uh, I'm not going to go over the chart, but overall the findings on it was that most, for the most part, uh, there doesn't seem to be an improvement in the amount of corruption that occurs in states after t uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There was only a positive change in three states, which was Nigeria, South Korea, and Uruguay. And there were actually some fairly major negative changes in a couple of other countries. Uh, seems to be probably based on the fact that people uh, after a TRC actually learn more about their state than they knew before. And so the perception may be the corruption is actually, you think that there's more corruption because now you're aware of it. Transparency actually leads to knowledge, and knowledge leads to belief in corruption. So it actually may work kind of in a contrary way. So my conclusions were there does seem to be a relationship between the use of a TRC and the growth of uh, electoral democracies, political rights, and civil liberties in that order in terms of uh, impact. 
The relationship seems to be higher than it is for post-conflict societies. It should be without, I'm sorry, without TRCs. Uh, the highest changes in electoral democracies, followed by political rights and civil liberties. Um, that there is not enough data on civil society currently to draw a conclusion. The percentage of corruption appears to actually increase, for the reason that I noted. And um, just one note on regional issues, the improvement in democracy appears to be the highest in Latin America and the lowest in sub-Saharan Africa. So although all states that had TRCs for the most part experienced a, an improvement, the improvement was greatest in Latin American countries and the slowest in sub-Saharan African countries, which may again be tied to economic reasons or other reasons that need to be sorted out. Uh, there are some things for further research, which I've indicated a few of them already, but um, the biggest one, if there's a difference between TRCs, if there's a relationship between TRCs and democracy, what about TRCs causes democracy to happen? Can we initiate that without doing a TRC? Are there lessons to be learned from that? I think it's a, that's a critical issue. Uh, why are some TRCs more successful than others? Uh, is there a growth in civil society that needs to be sorted out? And are the regional differences significant? And do other things such as economic growth have an impact on it that needs to be, uh, needs to be uh, judged? Thank you. Thank you for research on a very important question. And we'll save questions uh, till after the presentation. So let's move uh, directly to um, Professor uh, Carol McKenna from Ferris State University. Canadian and American culture of militarism. Coping mechanisms in a military-industrial service complex. She's bringing up maybe the old uh, C. Wright Mills work. We'll see where she goes with that. Professor McKenna. First, I'd like to say that um, Harry Micah was supposed to present today, and he is a, a friend of mine. And you've really missed out on a, on a wonderful presentation, but. He became sick, and although his prognosis is really quite good, he couldn't make it, but maybe next year. Uh, my research is drawn from uh, my experience, my personal experience partially, and, um, and my interests. I, uh, part of the research that I will um, discuss today comes from a book that I, that I researched and wrote and uh, had published in 2009. That covers the information that I will convey to you from the American military. However, um, the Canadian side is, is quite new. And um, that was, I, I took interest in that when I did some study on torture. And my question was, you know, how, could, and that, be, that began with Abu Ghraib. And my, my question was, how can you take what we would consider, um, how about normal, uh, you know, loosely defined, normal people and put them in situations and have them do really awful things? And so I did uh, some research on that, and I found that the Canadians were uh, were friends of, of ours, and there were some problems with the torture situation that involved the Canadians, too. And I, I presented this paper at a conference that was um, international with Canadians and Americans. And one of the Canadians in the audience, I, I said, is this, you know, is this what we want? You know, do, do we really want to resort to something like torture to make up reasons to have torture. And there was a, a Canadian gentleman in the audience that said, um, yes. And um, I thought maybe I should do more research on Canadians with, you know, with our relationship, okay? And so that's my introduction to what brought me to the Canadian uh, aspect, excuse me, of this. Um, I only took one chapter from my book, and that's uh, coping mechanisms, because I thought that that probably would be um, enough for this particular paper. And um, uh, the, I, my research was three, um, uh, uh, three tier 
in the American side, and that was I lived with a family, a military family. I also did interviews, and I also did document analysis. So one kind of complemented the other, and then the other made it possible for me to generalize, where the other was, you know, a small sampling. The Canadians, however, I have not gotten as far as interviews or, uh, or living with the family, although that's in the working. What I did was a document analysis. So what I was able to do was take some of the documents that I was able to get for the Canadians and, um, and compare them with what I have for the Americans. Now, this, is, this will be so basic to you that um, as I tell you my findings, I'm, I'm sure you're not going to be very surprised. Where I usually run into some conflict with, uh, with the audience is um, uh, uh, describing the findings, all right? So you'll have to be patient. All right, this is uh, some of my history. This is new to me. I've been researching this now for, for well over a decade. Um, but I usually never, I, I hardly ever gave any personal information. But I had an experience uh, last year that made me change my mind. And that was, I was teaching a course in minorities. And um, one of the students uh, gave my uh, chair a formal complaint. And in the complaint it said, and this is true, that I wanted all of the soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan dead. And so when he told me this, and he said, you know, you'll have to respond to this. And I said, I need time to think about this because I can't imagine in my craziest, wildest dreams what I may have said that anybody would think that. So the, the June before my son was married, in a military wedding. And so I copied the picture and I pasted it to my response. And I said, the three soldiers in this picture are my sons. So what I'm giving my class and what I'm giving you is the research data that I found. It is not necessarily what I feel or what I want to have happen. But as a researcher, you come upon many different surprises. Some of them you don't, you wish you never found, <laughs> okay? But that doesn't mean that you hide them or that they still have to come out and then they have to be discussed whether or not you like them. So um, I, w I was also married to uh, um, a military man. In fact, he was the commander uh, in Alpena here for a while. and. Um, and I have three sons in the Army. While I, in 2003, protested the war, so you can think of me whatever you wish, I had children in Iraq. I had two sons and a daughter-in-law in Iraq. So all those women that you saw, you know, moms against the war, and, and, that, <laughs> and that we were yelled at and spit at and uh, called unpatriotic, that may have been me but it wasn't because of how I felt about the soldiers. And now, of course, so many years later, um, all of the data, the information that's coming out, the war should never have occurred. I mean, there is, there is, there is no reason that the war, thank you. I, and I wish there were, but just because we're in there, but. Um, the, the topic of to stop loss was, to my knowledge, relatively new. And um, uh, some people feel that it was a grotesque, really grotesque um, uh, thing to do to the people in the military. But w we were so desperate to keep the soldiers that this, uh, this uh, program called Stop Loss, if you came in with your contract and it was expired, um, and you had, and you were able to get out. They would not allow you to get out. And they did this to our soldiers while um, some of them were still in Iraq. And so when you're in Iraq, you see, you can't just say, well, you know, excuse me, but I don't care. I'm going home because you're trapped. You stay there. And I have to admit that the soldiers and the wives that I did talk to had, had a, a good attitude about this except what I learned and what I will share with you is, you must have a good attitude to keep your sanity, okay? That's part of the socialization.
Okay, so I looked into human rights violations. I did research on torture with Canadians and Americans. And my question again and again was, how do we become like this? How does this happen? Can you really take you know, a, a person, a, a gentle person in many cases, and put them in an environment that is so ugly that they actually turn ugly? In my research, okay, can you see that? I'm not sure, um, I, and I'm not sure how to make it better either, but I will tell you what it says. The, uh, the posts that I, that I uh, researched and the family that I lived with, on the, on, I did some of the interviews on the post. And at the end of one of the interviews, the wife said to me, I, I shut off my, um, my recorder and sometimes they just like to stay and talk a little longer, and that was fine with me because I like them. I, I like doing that. And she said, you know, um, that's that writing up on the cliffs. And I said, you know, what writing? And she said, you know, the, the one that somebody spray painted with black spray paint that says, Iraq made our husbands mean. And I said, what? And she said, yeah, didn't you know about that? And I said, no, you mind if I turn on the recorder again? Because this is really important. And what you'll find if you do get into research, sometimes this stuff comes up out of nowhere. She was kind enough to take a picture. You can see her broom, OK? She went up there with her daughter and cleaned off the, the area. And, um, and she emailed me the picture with, with some other ones. I use this one when I talk about my research because it's telling. It's telling not only because just one woman probably did this, but it stayed up on that cliff, on, on the cliff, right outside of family housing for months. And the woman who told me about this was so upset that she said, nobody should do that. Nobody should see that. And, and she said, so I called it maintenance, but they said that they couldn't get up there because it would erode. It, it had something to do. With the, um, with the cliffs. And so she said, well, if the woman could get up there and do that, then surely we could get up there and spray paint it. But they could not. So it stayed up there when the snow was gone, and it stayed up there for months. I worked with two, or actually more than this, but the two that I will present today are the Thomas Theorem and positive asymmetry. Thomas' theorem is very common with sociologists, so I wouldn't be surprised if you heard of that. However, positive asymmetry, it was new to me, OK? So I, I um, but it, and a colleague of mine called me up and said, you've got to read this book. Karen Cirillo wrote this book, and it's so perfect for you, you know? And I said, OK. And sure enough, she was correct. The Thomas' theorem says, it's from 1928, and it was Dorothy and William Thomas, and they were researching uh, children. And so again, this is going to be so basic to you until I explain the things that I'm, I'm about to explain. What they said was, uh, things don't have to be real to have consequence, OK? That if you really believe in something, I mean really, really believe in something, it doesn't have to be me. Uh, it doesn't have to be real. It just has to be that you really believe in it. And then there will be consequences. Now, of course, whether the consequences will be good, bad, indifferent, you know, whatever, there will be consequences. And so what I found was many of the people I interviewed had to believe. They had to believe. They had to believe that we belonged in Iraq. They had to believe that their husbands were there for a reason. They had to believe that what they were doing was right. And it was reinforced at the memorial services. I mean, boxes of tissues would be passed out and people crying and sobbing. And then you would hear the, um, the bagpipes would play and their pictures would be out. And then they were encouraged to be positive. OK? It was like, now we have mourned and we could go on with our lives. And I watched this over and over. I went to the FRG meetings. That's um, a, a, it's called um, 
family readiness group, okay? Big support. The wives are so together on this. They really needed each other. They really worked together, okay? The positive asymmetry is a, um, a theory uh, that is best explained, and Karen Cirillo explains it uh, specifically in American culture. And what she said was, the reason that we can shop till we drop, for instance, is because we're taught to be positive. We must be positive. We get, if we're depressed, we get promotional, you know, people at Walmart. Come on, everybody, let's do exercises. We've got to, it, it, it's not their conditions that will ever change. It's not the environment that is ever going to change. And so they must be positive about it. And that's her argument. And she said, so we're not going to change if we're always doing, uh, having promotional speakers come in, if we always have people you know, putting their arms around and, uh, and saying it's going to be all right, and pretending, Thomas Theorem, pretending what is not real is. Pretending that we really believe in something that is not true. So those two um, theories really complemented each other and explained many of the findings in my research. Okay? So I think. <laughs> this, this is so basic when, when I think about this. Our economy is such that we must consume. We must. If we don't consume, the economy falls apart. So if you get $800 in taxes back, you have to go shop, and you shop till you drop. And you have a culture at the mall, and you have shopping, and you have to have cute shoes, and a great outfit, and a really, you have to look really handsome, and you have to be pampered, and prettied, and massaged. And that's what I found with the women that I interviewed. And some of them would cry. And one in particular said to me, as she was crying the entire time, she said, you know, Carol, I really tried. You know, the shop therapy? They actually call it shop therapy. They tell them, are you depressed? Go out and shop. Buy yourself something, OK? She cried. And she said, you know, they extended him in Iraq. And so I went out and I shopped, because we got money for it, you know? And so she said, and I shopped and I shopped. But she said, I just couldn't shop anymore. I just couldn't shop anymore. So she said, you know what I did? I got my teeth whitened, and I'm now going to a gym, and I get massages. And she's crying the whole time. And she said, I couldn't do it. I went back to my parents. I stayed with them. I needed help, with, but they, um, they had a son. And she said, I, uh, I couldn't do it if I didn't love him. But they tried everything. That was one. So you shop till you drop. You get massaged and prettied. You uh, support each other. And then if none of that works, oh, and you go to church. Very big church. Praying, getting together, very big. And then if none of that works, you go into counseling. And the first question that they ask is, are you depressed? And the answer is, yes. And then what they're offered is Prozac, or one of the other anti-anxiety pills. And some of the wives told me that they took them. Others said that they know uh, women that did take them. And then yet others said, you know, I really didn't want to take them, but I did, and I hated it, so I stopped taking them. So positive. Um, uh, asymmetric, I'm, I'm sorry, I just lost the name. P positive asymmetry, sorry. I mean, I know that one like my name. Um, applies here because they are not allowed. They are not allowed to be depressed. You have to, you know, buck up. You have to do this because the war is not going to change. The environment at Walmart is not going to change. So motivate yourself. You've got to change. You've got to be positive not the world and not the environment. And that's where I'm just a little radical. Because after you, you study this long enough, you just know that you don't have to have war. All the students that say to me things like, it's always been like that, it has not. It has not. 
In fact, there have been so many different cultures, so many different places, to even imply that we have always been at war is ridiculous and untrue. Volunteering, okay? I, um, some of the, um, the compare and contrast that I made with the culture of buying, uh, Canada is very much like that. Are you surprised? Probably not, okay? I mean, I did the research anyhow, but if you think for a moment that I was shocked at that, I was not, excuse me. Um, the pampering, um, occupying time. The uh, Americans have family readiness groups, they call them FRGs, wonderful source of support. These women get together, and I, I keep on saying wives and women, uh, well, because the, most of the soldiers are men, and um, the, the very few that I did meet, the spouses, and they're not called wives, they're called spouses. They used to be called wives, but then that was sexist, I believe, I'm not really sure, is that why? And then they changed it to spouse. But everybody knows they're wives. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, t oh I thought you told me to be quiet. <laughs> that would really be bad, 10 minutes, okay. <laughs> Um, oh, we have AFES, that's our shopping carnival thing, okay, and they have Canex. Um, I have carnival light because when I went, I've been shopping there for, oh my gosh, decades, okay? And, um, and it's nice, it's, you know, it's, it's a mall environment. So I'm not being critical of that, I'm just telling you how we are seduced into these things and into the economy. What the Canadians have is called Canex. And um, if you, and you could get this, I don't believe you can get into the site, I believe you have to have an ID number, but um, uh, for AFES, you could at least get on the very first page and what you're going to see is a big carnival. I mean, the marketers on these sites are magnificent. They talk you into buying things, little pop-ups come up and do you need flowers for your loved ones? How about buying a care package? We could send this, we could send... You must consume, you must. That's what we have to do, that's our job. And, and when we stop consuming, the economy will, will no longer be. Now this is where, and I can do this in 10 minutes. I happen to um, have the fortune, the very good fortune of watching this uh, economist. He's a Chilean economist and his name is Manfred Max Neef. And he said that there are certain things that are happening in Chile right now that are absolutely ridiculous. And he said, for instance, the area in Chile that I live, he said, has the most magnificent, it's magnificent cattle country. We have dairy products, we have fruits and vegetables. It's just a heavenly place to get all of these really healthy foods. And he said, I went to a hotel and there is a little packet of butter sitting there that came from New Zealand. He said, why? We have the most wonderful butter right down the road, but it comes from New Zealand. And that was his argument. He said, we must have an economy that is to serve the people, not people that serve the economy. And we can change. There is not a good enough reason, according to Manfred Max Neef, that we serve the economy. He said, nothing, nothing on this earth could be more important and better than life. And he said, all life, not just human life, not just white human life, not just hierarchical life, all life, animals, plants, the earth, we're destroying the earth, we're destroying ourselves. We have cancers and viruses now. Uh, and, and polluted water. I mean, do I even have to give you examples? He said that they're doing this now. Part of it is, uh, if not most of it, is the economy, our belief system. And then we must be positive about it. Look at all I bought today. What am I, I got all this money. I'm gonna spend it and buy and buy with no thought to what we're doing. And the third, he said, the economy must take into consideration the ultimate destruction of Earth and the ecosystem. Because if we don't, we will destroy ourselves and the Earth. And that can go right into the endless war. Okay, the endless war. And things that we might want to consider in our socioeconomics, 
Do we want justice, equality, community, reality? That we don't have to pretend and say, I believe, I believe, I believe in Walmart, and I believe in what's happening in the war, I believe in Iraq, and I believe we should have done this. Even though the facts are there over and over and over, can we live in a real life where we actually put fact after fact down? <coughs> Laws that provide more power to the wealthy and the powerful like during the slave trade, all of those slaves, the slave owners would say, I need my slaves. I mean, you don't really think I could have all this and still pay you. I mean, you're just slaves. Good slave-owning families, they were called. That's a belief. Can you really be a good slave-owning family? Could Ted Bundy really be, oh, a good family man. What a guy. All right, so we raped a couple women, killed them, tortured them. No, that would be an oxymoron. And that's how we need to look at what we're doing with, with our economy, with our, our socioeconomic system, OK? Um, a, frame, a framework of belief and pretense. That was the hub of my research what we have to believe in, what we are told to believe in, disregarding fact or a negating fact or a hiding fact. And I think that's it, right? Is it, no, I think it's it. OK. There you go. Excellent presentations. Very different, but certainly bring up a range of questions for us. And before we begin, I was reminded of when I came back from Ireland in the spring of 2003. I was over there with uh, 25 students. Um, and it, the best thing was, was seeing that our students saw the specific and comprehensive opposition to the war that we didn't see here. That we didn't see here. Different, different belief systems. So questions? Yes, ma'am, in the back. Y'all hear me? Oh, okay. This is for Carol. I congratulate you. I really do. Um, I personally am against war. I feel that I have to say it the right way. I don't want to want to take it the wrong way, but I feel like what America is doing is wrong. My belief in war is World War One, World War Two. What's going on now in Iraq and Afghanistan? I don't consider that a war. I feel like our children are over there dying for something that's not big enough to be dying for, and then they come home in a box. And like you said, they have to put in their head that, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. They have to tell themselves that they believe in something that they don't believe in. That's not healthy, no matter how you put it. If they don't believe in it, and they're trying to make themselves believe in it, that's making them sicker even more on the inside. And I just. I believe everything you said. I'm totally with you on that. And once again, I congratulate you. I have an older son that thinks being a soldier and going to war will be cool when he get older. I'm totally against it. And I might have to deal with that when he get older. And I would like to talk to you more personally on the side about that because it's going to be a time where I might have to deal with that. And I would need a little so-and-so from you. But I congratulate you, you. on the three sons and a daughter-in-law. I really do, because that's that got to be hard, especially if you don't believe in it. It really, really has to be hard. It gives us some interesting Thanksgiving dinners. <laughs> you know, on that, I think it's important that we all think about just war. There are some important, there's really some important academic work on when war is justifiable. I would refer you to uh, Walter's book, Just and Unjust Wars. More recently, um, Nada Crawford has an article out on uh, just war theory and counterterrorism. It actually was published three or four years ago, maybe more than that. Um, I was really impressed uh, that the Colonel mentioned Samantha Power's book on uh, genocide, mm -hmm. American Age of Genocide, and when war is justifiable there. It may be justifiable to go save 800,000 Rwandans before they're hacked to death in 100 days. That's pretty darn important, and our government failed to do so. So this conversation about just war is an important one to have. Yes, I agree. Yep. Um, this one goes towards Carol as well. 
Uh, you talked about the economy. And um, in my experience, everybody I've graduated with is either in a Marine, in the Army, or the Navy. And it's because they can't afford to do anything yes. else. This is true. And I, I, I find that our economy struggling right now, having, they've even had to send people away <laughs> that they, who wanted to be Marines. So I find, how does this play a role in, in terms of what can we do to stop this? Or um, in, in terms of the belief system, like what do we do to actually change that? Because I know in, in Ireland too, I was there uh, not too long ago, and, and they, they have peace and reconciliation uh, groups there too as well that work with the belief structures. And I find that it seems they're all, those peace and reconciliation groups are trying to be against conflict, but I don't, I don't know, do we, does the United States have anything like that? Do we try to encourage that? Because on the TV, you're just seeing you know, all these Army and Navy commercials. You drive down the highway going towards Alpine, you got a giant Marine sign on the billboard. I mean, it's not like we're supporting anything. And then you have these tea partiers who are like, we'll support our troops, and you, if you have a different opinion about this war, then you're not patriotic. And I know that happened mm -hmm. for like the mm -hmm. last eight years with Bush, which I'm not going to comment. <laughs> but, so what do, we, what do we have that we can do to facilitate uh, a change in our social structure? The, the recommendations that some of the um, economists have, have given, uh, people like the Chilean economist that I talked about, there's also Joseph Stiglitz, and um, oh my gosh, there, uh, uh, Dean Baker has some, but he's a little, um, a little out of there, but he, he has some good ideas. Um, Joseph Stiglitz, for instance, said there was no reason for all of these people to lose their houses and the foreclosures. It was systematic exploitation. We have this tendency to, um, to uh, blame these people and saying, oh, they spent too much money. But there were too many couples involved in this. You know, the kind of couples that would say something like, oh, come on, honey, we can afford this. You know, it's a modest home. It's our first one. So we won't get a new car. You know, so we'll both work for a little while. There were too many like that, too many. And, and then he or she would lose one or both of their jobs. Um, the the heart-wrenching stories about uh, one one out of so many, their little girl got leukemia, and um, and the prognosis was wonderful, except that at the end of the year when their health care expired, it was thirty thousand dollars or they wouldn't renew it. I mean, health care. Did you know that most of our credit cards go to pay for health care? I mean, that was an eye-opener for me. So to answer your question, there are economists out there with very good suggestions, but we can't continue giving a great deal of money to people who already have so very much and completely ignoring poverty and, and um, our waste and uh, the marketing strategy that you must have this, you must have that, and they target our children. And then the children grow up really believing that, you know, this is a really cool car, this is a really cool, you know, a dresser, or whatever it is. So the economy can be changed. We just can't continue to give such unequal or unequal um, uh, amounts of, of wealth and power to people who have the most. And that's called the Matthew effect for anybody out there interested in sociology. The Matthew effect, the, you know, the rich get richer and the poor get prison, you know. And so the laws are made to help the, the elite. I, I think I'd, yes. I'd like to kind of talk briefly on this as well. You know, I think that's one of the, the points of the Truth, Truth and Reconciliation Commission concept. But we do, there are other types of concepts that follow that same basic pattern, trying to put an end to, um, you know, continuous wars that happen over and over again because problems that occurred are never fixed. And one of the reasons why we had this, uh, this war agenda is because we have never really solved wars that happened in the past. And the, so the thought on it is, I mean, that's, that's my argument regarding the United States Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s that finally started to address the problems that happened 100 years earlier. The thought on it is that you can start to, to build an environment of, of human rights and, re, and, and and belief in the fact that the war shouldn't end eventually, but maybe put some people out of work, but that would be okay, you probably wouldn't mind. Um, but that, there's, that there should be ends to these things. And so you need to try methods like providing closure, documenting things, talking about it. One of the most positive things that's happened in the United States recently is the fact we've at least talked about 
what went into starting the war in Iraq and Afghanistan to begin with, and educated the public on it, and educated the public on the identity of the hijackers that uh, ran into the Twin Towers. And every time I teach one of my classes and I talk with this to my students, I'm amazed by the fact that somewhere between a third to a half of my students have no concept of what actually happened, and this is you know, nine years later. They still know nothing about it. So if you educate people and you try to make these sorts of extensions to people, I think you eventually can develop, to build up what you're looking for, but it requires talking about it. And it requires perhaps getting out some of the dirty laundry and discussing it. Yes. Um, and and I, let me just add one more thing. And thinking critically and carefully about it, don't believe what your government tells you. That's, that's actually Come democratic. On. You know, it's, so we, for some reason we think it's unpatriotic or patriotic to support the war or not. It's pretty darn important. The colonel referred to the people that, that were leaving Haiti. Well, they were leaving Haiti because things there were really, really, really bad. And one of the reasons they were bad is because we supported a kleptocracy, the Duvier regime. And then when Aristide, who was popularly elected, was overthrown, we supported Raul Cedras, in fact. And on leap year day, February 2004, the next coup that overthrew Aristide, well, your government was sort of behind that. Um, so, so we have to v watch our government very carefully. And by the way, when we say our government, who are we talking about? The corporations. Well, that's, that's part of it. But, you know, sort of sophomorically, you as well. Get involved, throw some elbows. But it's hard to do when you're economically disfranchised. Excellent questions. Thank you. Uh, just a, a question and a comment. Uh, uh, just a question to Julie. I yeah. was wondering, are you going to um, try to model the data you have in a regression analysis? I wasn't sure from what you were doing. You know, um, that's, a, that's a great question, and it's a technical one. Um, I, I have done it. Uh, this, like I said, this, this is really a preliminary study of it. It's part of my dissertation, and, and uh, my dissertation advisor and I are working on whether or not to just do a comparative case study or whether to actually try to do a statistical study. And I haven't decided yet. I think I will try it and see what happens. The problem is it's a really small end study. And the only thing that made it bigger was adding in the countries that didn't have TRCs, which gives me at least perhaps like 80 cases to work with, but it's still pretty small. For so those of you who aren't sure what that means, we're talking about statistically significant <laughs> findings. It took me a couple of years to understand that myself. So, yeah, great I, question. I, I would like to, and I, I think it would be helpful, but I need to trim the data down a bit, and I may add some cases on in order to do that. Yeah. If I can make the case bigger, I may be able to. Because the, the difference is, is it's quite small, but at the same time, if you ran the same models for your, your non-true commission group and your true yep. commission group, then you would have something to talk about, even if this finding is not you know, the coefficients are quite small, they're still a finding in a comparative context. So. Yeah, that's great, uh, that, that's, that's a helpful comment. I, I'm, I'm toying with that right now, I was actually just thinking about a couple days ago, yeah. when I, I sort of let this thing sit for a few weeks and then come back to it again, and that was what I was thinking about a couple days ago, and so, I don't know, yeah, great. hopefully, appreciate the comment. Thanks, um, cool. and I just had one comment, if yeah. that's okay, uh, to Carol. Uh, I also, um, like the girl behind, like really applaud you for your, your presentation. Um, you. It inspires me, I have to say. I just had a, just two comments because I think the student, was it a student that said that um, you clearly wanted all of the people in Iraq, uh, the military. The soldiers. The soldiers, yeah. It, that was a student, was it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because to me, and I'm actually, I've got a research project ongoing um, measuring uh, levels of verbal abuse in referendum campaigns because in Ireland we've had uh, reruns of referendum campaigns on European treaties. So we had a campaign on Nice 1 and then we had a second one on Nice 2. Um, we also had one on Lisbon Treaty uh, 1 referendum uh, and they public voted no so we had a second referendum. And so I'm trying to look at the intensity of the message between the two campaigns but also levels of verbal abuse. Mm -hmm. and, and actually I know you said that you had to respond to what that student said um, but because it was actually an act of verbal abuse, which is when one person defines the other. So that person said to you and told you what you wanted, which was actually contrary to what you wanted, clearly. But the fact that that student did that to you is that they defined you. And that is a way to shut somebody down. Mm -hmm. And it's normally done by somebody to stop somebody from talking. Because when you're subject to that, you get confused and you feel insecure and you question yourself, did I really say that? And you actually said that yourself. Yeah. You know, you were questioning, did I really say that? What course, could I have possibly said? Of course you didn't say that. And, and I suppose I'm, uh, I take my own philosophy towards this, even though it hasn't happened to me yet, but it might in terms of some of my research that would come out. But my, my, I think the appropriate response to that is, you know, you've, you've committed an act of verbal abuse and you need to apologize to me, mm. rather than having to produce photographs and having to justify this. 
And I think that we need to be more aware of verbal abuse and what it is in defining the other. It's part of the post-structuralist way of thinking about mm -hmm. things, which is mm -hmm. it's how it's translated. So I just wanted Thank to you. commend you. Yeah. I mean, that's you for good that. advice, actually. Um, yeah. And the other thing is about the patriotism, because uh, my neutrality is my, my subject matter, and I looked at the history of U.S. neutrality, and during the First World War. Uh, the American leader said, and his name escapes me now, but uh, he said uh, it, it is to be uh, an American and to be a patriot is to agree to neutrality. And to support neutrality was made uh, to be patriotic. And it's the inverse now in that supporting the war is made to be patriotic. In fact, so if you're not with us, you're against us. Yes, yeah. Bush, yeah, which, which had a real resonance for Ireland because after 9-11, we had a national day of mourning in Ireland. We, yes. we shut down our country for a day um, and we were the only ones I think in the world to do it. And so the public opinion was, was very strongly reactive in support of America and yet at the same time public opinion didn't support the war because they made the differentiation yeah. between the suffering of American people um, and Irish people are very connected to that, you know, there's 40 million people in America who have Irish, uh, you know, claims to Irish descent um, and yet there's the separation between that and government policy. Um, and the use of patriotism in the current discourse is exactly that. It's a way to define people. You are unpatriotic mm -hmm. and to shut them down. So just to say it fits into the, the post-structures way of, of doing things. Yeah, if I may great. add to that, one of the women that I interviewed uh, was from Germany. She married a, a, um, an American officer. And um, uh, she said when we discussed the war, she said, you know, in Germany, we're very careful not to be so nationalistic because we know what could happen. And I thought that was an interesting comment. Yeah, my question is for Julie. Um, you seem to be drawing a correlation uh, between um, the TRC countries and the growth of democracy. And you seem to talk about it in the sense that TRCs were causing the growth in democracies, but do you accept that? I'm not saying it caused it. I'm saying okay. there's a relationship. Just a correlation. Causation. Okay. No, it's not a correlation. It's a relationship. I just want to and confirm those are, that. Those are thank loaded you. terms. Yeah. It's a relationship. No, thank you. Okay. Yeah, it, it, I am not saying that it caused it. Yeah. I think it needs to be. In, it, it needs to be identified as to whether it causes it. Therefore, you need to know how it. If it does cause it, how it happens. And until you answer that question, you cannot say that there's a correlation or that, that it, it's a causative factor. Let's go with two more. That's the gentleman, thanks. Yeah, gentleman in the, in the middle and then uh, Mr. Smith in the back. Or Mr. Smith in the back first, okay? okay. And then we'll end up with you. We won't leave you hanging. All right. Question um, for Julie, but I, I think Carol will be interested to hear your thoughts on this as well. But maybe quickly, if our first announcement, just because since people have articulated concerns about anti-war sentiments, if you're interested, there are three anti-war for the ninth anniversary of the U.S. occupation of Iraq in the next two weeks in town, if anybody wants. I have flyers here for that. So, and we're going to be addressing things like, you know, uh, poverty being a source of recruitment for, for soldiers uh, uh, yes. in, in this country. Uh, my question is, is that relating to the issue about truth and reconciliation commissions, I, I couldn't help but looking at the list of countries that you were sort of looking at. And, you know, with the, if the list would have been there a little longer, I would have thought to myself, it seemed to me about three quarters of them that the U.S. historically has either directly military intervened, they either provide funding or training for the militaries there, they either supported proxy forces in those countries, or some form of so-called humanitarian aid that actually undermined and caused uh, human rights abuses. That, that would be my sort of broad sort of look at it. And I'm basing it in part on like the work of Greg Grand and some other scholars who have looked at truth and reconciliation commissions. Yep as well as my own experience in Guatemala and El Salvador. So I'm just wondering if that even once those countries had truth and reconciliation commissions, whether or not you looked at whether or not the U.S. continued an ongoing role in trying to actually undermine the process of, at least in my experience, within El Salvador and Guatemala, the U.S. tried to deny the outcome or the findings of the, 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 the U.N. Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So I'm just wondering if that's anything you looked at or if you've any thoughts about that. Uh, thanks. That, that's, a good, that's a good suggestion. I think it's one of the things I'm, I'm heading towards. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to punt a bit here because Latin America is not my area. And you're discussing Latin American cases and, and my dissertation advisor, that's her area. So I'm hoping she's going to help me out a bit with Latin America. But um, my area is Africa. And I'm very familiar with uh, Sierra Leone and American involvement in the Sierra Leonean 
um, and the Liberian Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. In both of those cases, the United States very much pushed for the, the facts to come out in those cases. Mm -hmm. So those, at least in Africa, U.S. involvement has been, for the most part, positive, the cases I've looked at intensely. Um, but that's a great question, and that's what I'll, I'll be looking at as one of, the, one of the factors in it. As I said, this is really preliminary work. P pass it down to, uh, just pass it straight ahead. There you go. Great question. And uh, finally. Appreciate it. Yep. Uh, my question minutes. is pretty direct. Um, uh, do you think in a society, it's for all of you, actually, um, in a society where we can't come together and decide whether we like Pepsi or Coke better, um, do you think we'll ever, like, see all the people come together and say, hey, you know, what you're doing here, government, is wrong. And, you know, what you're doing, economy, here, you know, like, this is wrong. Like, selling everything to people, you know, like, this is, we got to sell everything, you know, and to make it work. Do you think we'll ever see that change in our lifetime or what? We'll just go down the road, Carol. Good, good question. That's like a I, Yeah, that's an question. excellent question. <laughs> dissertation topic. Yeah, I, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to say yes, okay because I have seen so many changes already. And every time that somebody says we've always been like this, the answer is we have not. And sometimes in order to convince people, if I, if I, could, if I were forced into giving just one thing to convince people, it would be be honest. Be honest. Because once the honesty is there and once the facts are out, and that's where truth and reconciliation mm -hmm. will come out. It makes people feel a lot better. It really does, you know? So I'm, I wouldn't be here if I gave up, although I have to admit there are days. I'm going to play the devil's advocate, and I'm going to say no, and I'm happy about no. <laughs> My favorite classes are where I have two extremely opposite sides. I love the discussion. I love the give and take. I love people screaming and shouting and throwing things at each other. I think that's where society you progresses. Love my class. Oh, I have like fun classes. I have fun classes. We take child labor, and I make half the class be in favor of child labor and spend a half an hour proving why child labor is good for people. Um, and if you don't engage in those sorts of discussions and seriously try to look at issues, then society doesn't progress. So I think one of the problems we have is too many people are following whatever you know path they think is what should be happening. I think we need to be challenged. And find your 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 even your dissertation topic. They occasionally have to be shaken up by people, and that's great. Uh, and that's what some of the questions today have done for me, which has been helpful. But you have to have that happen. You cannot have your belief system. We can't all be the same, because then society would die. So I'm going to say no. That's right. And I'm going to go down the pipe <laughs> and say we absolutely have to have that dialogue. But I still sophomorically believe that we can make the world a better place. And that we have to have dialogue. We have to have compromise. We have to have truth. We have to have reconciliation. We have to have information. We have to be critical thinkers. And we have to have places like Grand Rapids Community College to hold peace conferences. Here, here. Well this done. Been fun, by the way. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Wrap all that up in uh, 30 seconds there.